So we, we do, I do have some slides and stuff like that, but we'll probably just kick it off, talk, and then we'll click through to stuff, play some videos, and uh, keep this super chill. And uh, we'll open up for questions as well. So, uh, I don't know, should we start them off? Yeah, let's do it. So let's dive into what we're, where we're, what we're all here this weekend for, the Super Bowl. This year represents a pretty significant step change from Pep Pepsi's deca decade long role as the halftime show sponsor. So Todd, tell us a little bit how you're approaching the overall brand presence and activation this year and with that change and what you're most excited about. Yeah, I think there's um, <clears throat> a lot of things. I think as it was just kicked off, you know, Pepsi actually is, and this is not just my own bias, but we're the number one brand most associated with the Super Bowl. Um, and uh, it's because we, for years, have had, you know, different advertisements, different, you know, the halftime show, all that kind of stuff. And we, we love kind of the big cultural moment that the Super Bowl provides. We know the viewing occasion is a big moment for us where people are drinking Pepsi in their rooms, you know, while they're, while they're watching in their living rooms and stuff. And so... Um, you know, yeah, it's been a decade. We had the halftime show for 10 years and uh, we thought, you know, listen, we wanted to go out on top. We had a really great showing last year and uh, I think it was just time for us to move on to kind of what's next. And I think there's a lot of things as we think about the broad media mix and, and where we're going to be going moving forward. But what I'd say for this year specifically, uh, we have a really big focus on uh, Zero Sugar. Pepsi Zero Sugar is one of our, our biggest bets that we're making as we recently just reformulated uh, the product into this really new and improved taste, which is delicious. I suggest you try it. But um, and uh, we'll be making a big bet. We have two spots uh, coming up on the game, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. So speaking of that, the Pepsi Zero Sugar campaign. I know you launched the teasers last week and yeah. launched the two or released the two spots that are airing in the Super Bowl. I believe on Wednesday. Yeah. Can you share with us a little about the cr creative and how? Yeah. You yeah. So let me see. Um, does this thing click? Oh, look at that. Um, here, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Um, all right, so we'll even show you the teasers we'll and the show creative. You some teasers here. Okay. Um, oh, so here's the big the big idea is this is that um all right, so we're we're doubling down on zero. You can't read this, so don't don't even worry about it. But the um the, the, the big idea is that um, we just recently reformulated our product and it actually is a advantaged product, which means it tastes better than the other guys, right? And for us, that's a big deal. And we want to tell everyone, like, try it. It's really good. We want to drive trial because it's a new, a new formulation. But the thought is, if we tell everybody in an ad, like, how good it tastes, uh, why, w why would anybody believe us? They're going to be like, well, of course, you guys think it tastes good. You're freaking Pepsi. Like, of course, like, you just made it. Like, why should I believe you, right? And that was kind of this foundational kind of insight behind this whole campaign, um, because the real consumer truth is that... Um, People don't trust advertising, you know, and as a marketer up here who's saying, you know, there's a healthy skepticism around marketing in general, right? Um, when you think of um, a laundry detergent commercial and the person's getting out the stains and like that person didn't do the laundry, they're an actor, you know, like the person, the bartender pouring the beer in the beer commercial, like all these people are paid actors. They're not like happy families, they're not whatever, and they're paid to say things. And so there's this general distrust and also the bigger trend as you think about deep fakes, not knowing what's real, what's not nowadays. And when you think about that, then on the Super Bowl is when this is probably at its worst because that's when every brand basically brings in a celebrity that has no affiliation with the brand to talk about that brand and say, look at me, buy this, check it out. Um, and it's a really interesting kind of cultural truth. And Pepsi obviously has played into that like a lot of other brands and we've had celebrities and musicians and people. And it's, it's a part of kind of culturally what happens in marketing. And we thought that's a really interesting truth to kind of flip on its head as we think about we're trying to get people to literally like understand this product is really, really good and you should try it. And so it kicked off this campaign that we're calling um, Great Acting or Great Taste. And it's really this idea of playing with kind of what's real and what's acting and really playing with consumers uh, understanding of that idea with some just being very direct with some actors. And so we signed, um, you know, some, some pretty big names with this. So both Steve Martin and Ben Stiller, and I'm not going to you guys know who they are, hopefully. Um, but, you know, obviously just comedic geniuses, very just well-known, well-recognized cross generations. And we thought that they could help blur the lines between what's real and what's acting. We also brought in uh, Yorma Takone to direct. Um, and he, uh, for those who don't know him, he's from The Lonely Island. Um, he was in uh, Pop Star and directed that movie, you know, with Andy Samberg, a lot of other things. Um, and then uh, Rachel Dratch uh, from Saturday Night Live makes a, a cameo in, uh, in Ben's spot. But the, um, the concept is, how do you get these 
these really great comedic actors to play with this really human truth and tension around kind of advertising not being real. And um, so we dropped a teaser, as you mentioned, uh, about like a week ago, and, uh, and it's been going crazy online, which is great with Ben and Steve. So I'll, I'll show you both the, ten, the teasers of the two of them, uh, just to get a feel for uh, how they start playing with this concept of uh, acting. Hey, I'm actor Ben Stiller. And I'm better actor Steve Martin. What? Well, you're a comic actor, that's not really acting. Okay, you couldn't act your way out of a paper bag. Oh, you couldn't act your way into the paper bag that I was acting in. That makes no sense. Well, oh, so now we're making sense. <laughs> Over actor. Under actor. Sell out. You're doing a commercial. So are you. Pepsi, zero sugar. Tastes great. Screw you. No, screw you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ben Stiller. And I'm Steve Martin. As actors, in a way, we never really stop acting. For example, Ben is acting right now like he's not intimidated standing next to me. And Steve's acting like he's not lucky to be here. Oh, and Ben's acting like that whole awkward thing he does is a character, not his actual personality. <laughs> and Steve's acting like, ooh, I'm Steve Martin, when really he's not so, it's like, okay, we get it. You're like, I mean, whatever, you know, yeah. you know. See what I mean? Okay, banjo player. Nepple baby. You know what, Steve, I actually don't want to do this because I'm a huge fan of yours, really. Thank you, and honestly, I'm a big fan of yours. Really? I was acting. So was I, this whole time. That's what we started out talking about, how we're always acting. I was acting the whole time. All right, so you get the idea of just this kind of playfulness of, I'd have to clap for that's fine, sure. Um, but it's just kind of this playful tension that exists um, uh, with that concept of what's acting and what's real. And then, um, you know, what we ended up doing is then the Monday after we dropped those teasers is we announced that um, a very famous model slash actor, uh, Derek Zoolander, uh, would be making an appearance in, uh, in Ben's spot, uh, which is pretty exciting for anybody who knows that movie. It's uh, really, really ridiculously good. Um, and um, so, and then um, we, premiered the campaign uh, a couple days ago, and uh, it's been doing well. We're gonna have, like I said, two spots in the game. Uh, so definitely look out for them when you watch. I will show you both spots right now, uh, and we can go from there. But you can get kind of the whole premise. So um, why don't we start with Ben's first. And um, you know, Ben, when you think of Ben as an actor, he's just such a great character actor and plays these over-the-top silly roles. And so the thought is we, we built his spot around kind of these you know, fantastical movies that you've never seen that like, he could be acting in and how he'll break the fourth wall on what's real and what's acting. So without further ado, I will play uh, Ben's Super Bowl spot. Stay away from my wife. Hi, I'm Ben Stiller. My job as an actor is making you believe what you're seeing is real. Oh. Louise, will you? The pain is real. That the gold is real. Don't say that about yourself. I know. I know. The friendship is real. The real is real. But it's not real, it's just acting. Wow, that's like really good. Or was I just acting? Only way to know is to try it for yourself. This is really, really ridiculously good tasting. All right, so that's uh, Ben's spot. <clears throat> and, uh, whoops, and then Steve's, you know, and Steve's a bit of a, you know, well, Ben's a, a great character. Actor. Steve really plays these characters that are very close into kind of who he is and much more relatable, less over the top, right? You think of movies like Father of the Bride, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. A, a lot of the stuff that he does is, uh, is very relatable. And so how we brought his um, what's real, what's acting to life uh, is in a very Steve Martin kind of way. So check it out. I think you're gonna like your new nose, Miss Hastings. I'm Steve Martin. As an actor, it's my job to make people believe that what they're seeing is real. Ha! I... <laughs> hey! That the frustration is real. Man, I'm hungry. <laughs> oh, the disappointment is real. One, two, three, four! Winner! Eat it, Kyle. 
You're all losers. That the joy is real, but it's not real. It's acting. Wow! It's fantastic! Or was I just acting? Only way to find out is to try it yourself. All right, so those are the spots that'll be airing in the Super Bowl. Oh, thank you. I love yeah, it. Sure. And that, that's Ben Stiller's first Super Bowl spot, right? That's, like, ever? Correct. That's yeah. Ben's first Super Bowl spot, yeah. and that's Steve Martin's first commercial ever, which is pretty cool. And this also, we're going to have um, some in-game billboards as well. So, like, you know, when they do the kind of presented by with just Zoolander being silly pouring Pepsi Zero Sugar all over himself and whatnot, which will be pretty fun. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, we'll have a whole lot of other stuff online too. I'll skip through all this stuff. So, oh, and the other thing, just one last thing and then we'll get to talking is we are actually um, putting our money where our mouth is. So the whole idea of the only way to know is to try it yourself. Um, we're giving out um, up to 10 million free bottles of Pepsi Zero Sugar. So you can try it for yourself. If you just text uh, free zero, we'll reimburse you if you upload your receipt that you bought one and we'll, we'll pay for it. So uh, it's kind of just a nice way just to say like, hey, check out the new product. It's pretty simple uh, product forward uh, campaign. So that is the, um, the spot. So. Well, Todd, I love it. The creative concept is awesome. And obviously, you have two comedic geniuses involved. So that's fantastic. Congrats to you and your team. So I know you, you stated that it kind of was based off a of human truth. Is that how when you and your team are kind of ideating other campaigns, is that where you start? Is just a human truth? You talk about culture first, brand, yeah. culture in, brand out, I think yeah, you like to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I'm like a total um, insights nerd with all this kind of stuff. And so the type of um, marketing and advertising that I like to do and our team really prides itself on doing is always based on cultural and consumer insights first. And so um, while clearly every brand has a strategy and something you're trying to get these people to drink you or try you or whatever it is and your target audience and why they should believe it, a lot of brands miss the fact of like the why the hell should I care uh, piece of it. and how you connect to something that's real um, in people's heads and brains and in culture at that moment is really important. And so we always start off everything, and my team knows I, I torture this around the idea of bringing a cultural truth, a consumer truth, and a product truth, and where those things intersect uh, is really where the creative idea really starts and really trying to tease out the right tension creatively to build an idea. And so this is a very simple one, very just brick to forehead kind of simplicity that uh, is relatable because of that. I love that. And how else is Pepsi really pushing the envelope when it comes to creative? I know you like to say, and I know that Pepsi is more of a content marketer or an ent entertainment marketer over a brand marketer. What are some of your proudest moments when it comes to creative and what were the results? Yeah, I think, um, you know, as a content marketer, it's, it's, it's funny. We, we like to approach a lot of this stuff. Like I don't like the idea of ads, you know, and advertising, but more just kind of content creation. Now that's a very broad, loose term that can be a, you know, we've done everything from creating, um, you know, actual TV shows that are multi-episodic shows. We've done documentary films. We've done just sh short form content. Like last year for the halftime show, we made this piece called the call, uh, that was on, you know, just online only, but it got, you know, millions and millions of views and, and buzz and all that. But I think the, the big premise is back to this consumer truth of, People don't want to watch your ad. They want to watch what the hell they want to watch. They want to enjoy themselves. They want to forward something to a friend. And so there's a time and a place for ads uh, and paid media. Um, but you need a healthy balance between that. Because if all you're doing is making like, buy me, try me, do this, do that, and shouting in paid places, it's very easy to be ignored. And when you think of yourself in your daily life as a consumer, how much of the content you consume is actually paid media versus a text from a friend, a news article you're reading, streaming, you know, some other stuff that's just more organic. And so what we've tried to focus on is building creative ideas that will more organically get into kind of that ecosystem of like, hey, maybe I'd send this to my friend. Maybe I'd see this in my social media feed. Maybe I, you know, whatever. Wow. We use paid to do these very focused kind of more product, keep the lights on kind of stuff as well. So it's a, it's a healthy balance, but um, you know, it's, it seems to be working pretty well for us. 
I love that. And a lot of these campaigns, I think, would be considered culture bombs. It's a, a term you like to use a lot. Yes. Um, and I think it is something that Pepsi really excels at, is really being a part of large cultural disruptions. Like you've said, you've, you've, you've dived into NFTs, you've, had, you've launched music videos, even full, co-produced, full-long uh, episodic shows with Showtime, Fox, MTV. Yeah. You even created new food innovations. Has anyone here tried Pilk, Pepsi and Milk? <laughs> Pilk, it's, it's delicious. <laughs> we'll try we could, it after we could try it at the break. <laughs> All right, but yeah, there's. Um, listen, I think that's the idea, and this idea of you call. You know, I, I created this word "culture bombs" a, a couple of years ago with my team as a way to kind of talk about the model, and the the concept is that creating ideas that you can drop in a culture where when you deploy them, they create a ripple of earned in social media organic buzz. The news covers that, some PR beats happen, social people forward it, and they're differing degrees, you know, some are like bigger than others, depending on the insight, the truth, and then if it starts to ripple, that's when you can pour some paid on top of it on Twitter or on YouTube or on whatever those kind of things are to, to help it kind of go. And so we've been doing little things like that, whether it's little product innovations like um, Pepsi Peeps, you know, uh, all the way to creating a, a restaurant ghost kitchen called Pep's Place and, and everything in between. Um, and uh, it, what it does, though, for a, a brand and a product like ours that's not top of mind is it brings, again, our category and our brand top of mind awareness, which is a big driver right now of purchase intent and continues to express our brand point of view in different creative ways that over time continue to reinforce what our brand stands for and all that kind of stuff. So with that, Todd, how do you find the right opportunity like how do you know how do you keep up with what the consumer feels is relevant what they feel is interesting what's really going to grab their attention yeah it, it really it's it starts with knowing who you are as a brand and what you stand for and we're very clear on what we stand for on brand pepsi and then as you think about these cultural truths and consumer insights then say well what would pepsi's point of view be on this how would we address this or is there something interesting we can tap into within culture that can connect it and then you start to kind of ideate on the idea. So this example of Pilk that you said, I don't know if you guys uh, saw this thing. So basically um, on TikTok, well, I, I can go back five, six years ago in Utah, this idea of like soda mixology started. And it's people putting stuff in their sodas and mixing it, you know, and, and all that. And it was very narrow, just kind of within Utah and things like that. And then I'd say this last year on TikTok, people started discovering it and trying it. And basically the concept is pouring milk into your Pepsi and you're going to say, Ooh, what? But you, you do it in your coffee and it tastes delicious. So, um, and so, and don't knock it till you try it. Um, but I would say, uh, and so we start, we saw this thing happening and said, okay, well, what about, you know, how do you create this like sticky name pilk and what can we do around it? And so we created this thing around the holidays, uh, with pilk and cookies. Um, so you think of when is, you know, when Santa, you know, comes and you leave out milk and cookies, that's an interesting thing. So, we created this thing around Pilk and Cookies. We brought in Lindsay Lohan, uh, who's known around the holidays for, uh, you know, the Santa and Mean Girls and all that kind of stuff, and had a really just very, you know, um, quick online video we did. Very, We turned this whole thing around in like a couple weeks, and um, the thing went bonkers, and everyone was, you know, was trending on Twitter, and everyone was talking. I mean, the thing got, I think, over like 10 billion earned media impression, it, and, and it's during a time of year, again, keep in mind, when our competitor leans in very heavily with polar bears and Santa Claus and red and all this stuff. And we drove a ton of share of voice with an idea that really didn't cost us a lot of money and just kind of culturally connected and gave consumers new ways to try our product uh, in a new uh, delicious way and struck a chord. And so just little things like that, trying to, um, you know, continue to push is what we, what we always do. And I confirmed with Todd earlier, almond and oat pilk is allowed. It's a thing. It's a good, yeah, we can, we can try it at the break. They have some creamer here and just pour it in. It's, I'm telling Are you. Are you a fan good. of pilk? I am. I am actually. I was kind of like a little bit like, oh, let's check it out. It's a, um, it's a thicker, it's almost like it's like an eggnog kind of vibe, like, but it's, it's good. It's good. I love it. All right. So another big piece of attention throughout the years or like is, you know, a brand integrating into large scale events or tent poles, which has evolved quite a bit with the pandemic. But how, can you speak to how PepsiCo is still um, creating these special experiential moments for consumers? I know with, you know, giving away free bottles, that's an example. Um, and what do you think the future of 
uh, digital forward experience, experiential marketing is? Yeah, I think um, experiential marketing is is a really interesting word even to start with because when I say experiential marketing, your brain probably goes to like grassroots, the NFL experience here, throw the football through the hoop, run the 50 yard dash kind of shit, sampling, all that stuff. Um, but the reality is um, you experience things uh, both digitally and physically, and it's blurring a lot more today. You know, I love this word fidgetal uh, that, gets cost that gets tossed around quite a bit. Um, one of the most interesting photos, you know, I'm a, I'm a big Laker fan. I don't know if you guys saw when LeBron broke the uh, scoring record the other day. There's this really great photo that shows when he's making the shot, you see the crowd and literally every single person has their phone up except for Phil Knight, who's just a, a badass, just watching, just whatever. But, um, but every single person has their phone up, and you can Google this thing, and it is, um, it's interesting. These people paid, th especially by the court side, they paid $8,000 a ticket, and they're literally watching this historic, amazing moment through like a three-inch screen with some guy's shoulder in front of them, and, and it's more, and, and that is just an insight in itself of like, this desire to be connected as real life moments happen, it's not good enough to just be like, yeah, I was there, it was crazy, man, you should have seen it. It's gotta be like, here's proof I was there, I've shared it that I was there, I have my own personal, you know, filmed video that I was there, and I want everyone to know I was there, and I'm gonna send it to my family and put it on my social media, and, and it's just a real truth of that's how people are, you go to a concert, same thing, you go to the Super Bowl, you'll see this, I mean, this is how it works nowadays, and so when you think about experiences, um, that's a really rich opportunity for people who do historically grassroots marketing, right? Because it's the ROI on grassroots. It's like, oh, you're talking to like, you know, 2,000 people versus 200,000 people. And But now, if you can build something that's interesting enough that they're going to want to share or that has that kind of, you know, ripple beyond it, then, and you have to build it with that in mind, not just about, hey, come into my little brand museum here and play with all the cool things. It's what are you, go what's going to be the talk track? How do you want to connect the digital experience so that it's seamless uh, with the physical one? And so I think this idea of digital is going to become more and more important um, for brands. And I'm assuming you use the human truths and that cultural insight yeah. to build out experiential totally. opportunities well, just the, like you do. It's the same thing, too. And it, this drives me crazy, too, when I see a lot of brands doing this is, um, you know, listen, uh, we could build a, you know, if, if I wanted to build a Disneyland for Pepsi, I could could do that with, you know, Pepsi fountains and Pepsi thing and all this stuff. And like, it, I'd feel great about it because it would be like all Pepsi and all the stuff and the things we want people to hear. But like, why would a consumer give a shit about any of that is the real question, right? And so when you see here, you know, at the end, if you come here to the Super Bowl, you don't want to come to the Super Bowl to spend, you know, 10 minutes in a uh, museum about Pepsi. You want to learn about football or whatever. And so if we build something about football that can kind of, you know, so it just depends on trying to really connect to the why people are there. Why should they spend their precious time with your brand in that experience? What's the takeaway you want and how can it ripple beyond that experience is really uh, what's important. I love that. And speaking of digital forward experiential marketing, I know the metaverse is a hot topic in our industry right now. What's your take on it? And what if you could create one thing in the metaverse, what would it be? Yeah, um, man, that's a, that's a loaded question because I think the, the first rule of the metaverse is there is no metaverse. There's <laughs> a, the idea of the metaverse exists. There's a lot of like interesting things happening, but there's no metaverse right now. But um, but what I would say is um, I do agree, you know, as you think of the future of Web3 and NFTs and the blockchain and the metaverse and all of that. I think a lot of things are going more in that direction and uh, it provides a really rich opportunity for consumers to reimagine how they connect with consumers uh, in a way where they can actually have one-on-one -on -one interactions, give value to consumers in new ways, create new experiences, both that virtual and physical, you know, as you get into VR and all that kind of stuff also. So um, I think, um, you know, and you're already seeing it with people doing concerts in Fortnite and Decentraland and all, all the kind of stuff that's out there, Roblox. Um, and it, it's it's happening already because even I look at like my kids who are playing you know Roblox or Fortnite or whatever and they literally will spend three hours talking with their friends virtually and meeting up there you know now again and and so it's it's how those things grow and how the technology grows and expands I think will provide richer opportunities for brands to um, connect in that space but it's it's definitely an area to keep your eye on 
Absolutely. So let's shift back to the NFL. We know that strategic brand alignments, of course, play a significant role in capturing attention, and the NFL has been a big one for Pepsi. One big change that we at YouTube just announced that we will be exclusively licensing and distributing the NFL Sunday ticket, which is very exciting, but it's also a reminder that the media landscape is constantly evolving um, with, you know, with the consumer behavior and ha uh, habit shifts. So how has your NFL partnership evolved throughout the years and what do you think the future of the nfl fanship is well, i think it's interesting i think the the broader media thing you talk about with youtube like think of every tv now again and i don't know when the last time each of you bought a tv but most tvs now come connected and you can scroll little apps and you download you know it's not a great user experience where you got to go from youtube to disney to netflix to this and that and you don't know what's on what's free what to pay for so there's a whole disruption where that will get consolidated hopefully with the universal remote type concept moving forward but um but because of that um you know just what's on tv isn't the same so it's interesting that youtube has the sunday ticket or that i can watch on amazon you know and all, all the different places now where you can find sports concerts now the nfl is an interesting one because it's probably the last great you know live experience that's out there that pulls crazy ratings um if you look at the top 20 most ra highest rated broadcasts it's usually all nfl football games um and so there is something about the live in the moment of because it's sunday it's tune in viewing it's you know it's got huge avidity connected to it with teams and fandom so there's definitely something there but i think the future of it will continue um to be more digital in terms of you look at fantasy you look at stats you look at all the different ways where you can connect with your fans and like-minded people while you're watching um you know there could be virtual watch rooms where all the eagles fans go and connect and do you know so there's a whole lot of stuff as you bring that stadium experience into the viewing experience at your home as the technology evolves but i think the nfl's kind of the anomaly in the media scape landscape right now because um it is tune in viewing and people uh, you know will continue to watch more in the the linear fashion as well and you'll be there live on sunday who are you rooting for i'm kind of not i mean I'm, i'll be there live but i um i don't i'm not of a horse in the race with the eagles and the chiefs i uh, i think they're both great uh teams i love obviously watching mahomes and everything the chiefs are doing but i think the eagles look like a really really tough team this year so uh, i think the eagles may pull it out but again that's, that's why they play the games who knows yeah i went to villanova so i have to root for the eagles you, you know gotta, you got to Philly. Of course. Uh, one more question before we'll open it up to a Q&A with the audience, but everyone knows the Pepsi brand, right? It's like a brand with massive, massive awareness. And I think you and your team do a fantastic job of continuing to build brand relevance and just like building deeper connections with consumers. What piece of advice would you give other brand marketers in order to do the same? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's a good question because a lot of people are like, oh, well, Pepsi, you have millions of dollars and all these people. And, ah, and it's like, listen, it, it has nothing to do with anything like so we've we've started new brands like Bubbly Sparkling Water. We've done legacy brands like Pepsi. And I think the crux of it is this. And I tell this to my team as well when, you know, if our budget gets cut or something is like. If it's a creative idea and it's anchored in a real simple human truth and it's culturally connecting to people like you have a shot at breaking through you need to be focused on what your core objective is and how you want to market so again for pepsi that has mass awareness um i don't care about awareness because people have heard of pepsi and so i get pitched shit all the time where they're like presented by pepsi and i'm like why do i want that um, no one cares that i'm presenting anything like what are we doing with people like now if i'm a new brand that is launching like that's interesting because it's getting my name out there and so understanding the different tactics and tools that uh, apply to your brand and where your brand is in its life cycle and ecosystem and understanding what success metrics look like too right like not every brand needs to be the hottest shit in culture not every brand needs to drive trial for the, and so if it's about getting people to try your product Product, then let's focus there if it's about it and so there's a lot of different things to say but I think it all really starts down to number one making sure you know who your brand is and have a healthy self-awareness not who you want your brand to be but who it actually is and how it's perceived by consumers or not perceived by consumers in the world and then number two getting clear on those kind of cultural and consumer truths and then number three is building out 
creative ideas with or without media that um, can speak to that in a way that uh, is interesting for somebody to put out in the world. And the filter I usually use with my team is I call it the um, the bullshit test. And it's, it's pretty simple, is um, if you or your teams are making something that you yourself would not share on your social media, text to a friend, talk to somebody about, read an article about, keep working on it. It's not right. And that's not because you're at the company. And so you'd be surprised how many people just say, oh, well, we ran out of time or I guess it's good. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't go into I wouldn't spend 10 minutes, you know, filling out all these fields in the consumer experience. And it's so layered and friction forward. Um, then why the hell would anybody else like fix it? Like, you know, so it's, it's those kind of things that I think just continuing to um, to push with the team and make sure that everybody puts the consumer at the center of everything. And, um, you know, has just a real bullshit filter on it and uh, I think you'll be able to do some good stuff. And I think this Pepsi Zero Sugar campaign is a great example of how you're doing that. So congrats again. Oh, thank you. Looking forward to seeing the spots on Sunday. It'll be cool. Um, so now I think we can open it up to questions if anyone has any. Uh, I'm just wondering to capitalize on some of the cultural moments you need to kind of sometimes operate at light speed um, you have a whole roster of fantastic agency partners that you work with are those are the agencies kind of pitching you on those are you coming up with nuggets and it's going great, back to them? love to hear about great sort of the question great question and um, yeah like it's um, and it's a it's not an easy muscle to do right a lot of agencies and here's the other kind of cheat code I would say is that um, the marketing industry right now has a healthy degree of um, formality within it, right? Clients, agencies, media's bought, sold. It's it's like this kind of mad men, old school kind of world where like, we're gonna sell you this, we're gonna pitch you this, I'm gonna buy an idea, I'm gonna buy the media and place it, it's gonna reach these people and then you're gonna watch your business move. That's not real, right? At the end of the day, if you're trying to get something in real time, it's not gonna come back and forth from the, an agency just pitching, sometimes it will be, but like for the most part, pitching you an idea and then you giving feedback and then coming back and then green lighting it and all that, that process takes months and you've already missed a lot of moments. And so we do a lot of what I call um, collaborativity is another thing I, I talk about with our agencies and it's, yeah, it's combined collaboration <laughs> and creativity. How about that? Um, gotta start trademarking some of these things. But the, um, um, and it's essentially this idea where we kind of flatten the process and we work with our agency partners no different than ourselves and we have something that I call round zero uh, where we bring back literally just the cultural and consumer truths with a one-line idea nugget of hey there might be this idea around pushing off the tension around um, what's real or what's acting and there's probably like 20 other things like that and we talk about them we then decide this is the ones that the richest ones that to really go after and then we build executions uh, around those ideas and then kind of go from there because a lot of times the formal creative process um, you get pitched an execution with an idea at the same time and you either fall in love with something about the execution but there's no idea or you throw out a great idea because there's something really annoying in the execution and it's this back and forth and so really breaking down those agency barriers to kind of collaborate with you i think is a really um, helpful tool that's worked well for us sorry yeah of the things that you've done in the web three space what are the things that really are showing promise because there's a lot of friction in the space right now and a lot of talks. Love to see what you guys are seeing through your experimentation. Yeah, um, Web three. Listen, it's a shitty experience right now. Right? It's just, there's no if, ands, or but about it. Right? It's um, it's friction forward. You gotta put in all your personal information, get a digital wallet, get cryptocurrency, go do this. Get like it's it's layered um, and it's it's not simple. Um, and I think that's not what the experience will be 10 years from now, right? And I equate it to almost like, um, for those around with the advent of email or when the internet started really rolling out, when it was just like the page would load and all that would take forever, right? Or uh, when you had the green little text on the thing for your email and it was like very kind of, like again, it's the tech is there, but it's not user forward right now. And so right now, 
I don't think you can judge the experience people have today as to like what success looks like in Web3. I think right now it's about people getting their feet wet, understanding it, getting their organizations comfortable, getting consumers comfortable in the space. Of course, there's early adopters and there's cool things now. We've done this thing called the Pepsi Mic Drop that uh, was a very successful kind of NFT uh, program that we've dropped and had a couple uh, you know iterations of that throughout. But um, yeah, I think we're just kind of getting our feet wet like anyone else, which uh, is great. And for those of you who don't follow Todd on LinkedIn, please do, because he's always sharing a lot of great insights and perspectives and you know updates on what he's doing with Pepsi. So it's a great follow. One more question over here. Hey, Todd. Hey, how are you? Good, how you doing? Good. Um, so the previous panel on NIL, I thought was fascinating. And I yeah. just kind of wanted to get your POV on you know, either your position um, or Pepsi's position on it. Um, how much do you talk about it internally? Does it maybe conflict with your investment in pro sports? Just curious to hear. Um, yeah, I think it's fascinating. Um, I honestly think, and I was talking to, to Leonard and some of the people who are in this space as well, like, um, I think it's fascinating space and it opens up limitless possibilities, right? You can sign a, a swimmer, a football player, whatever, all this stuff. The thought of just signing somebody to sign them for a brand with mass awareness is not interesting. Because um, now the question is, if there's a creative idea that relies on, so if you've got a college rivalry week or these, you know, certain storylines or somebody, then that's more interesting. Um, I also think there's an idea that's interesting of, um, you know, when when you get somebody in their life cycles. So as a brand like Pepsi, you know, and music is another example where we've done this a lot. We can hire Beyonce up here, or we can hire Beyonce in Destiny's Child, right? And, or somewhere in the middle, right when they're about to tip and really have that next big moment in Pepsi. That's like the sweet spot where Pepsi typically helps people who are stars become superstars and all that stuff. But we've talked a lot about, um, we've launched this program called like Pepsi Music Labs to really start with the more um, fostering, you know, the real talented people at an earlier stage and, and growing them. The question is, um, if you were with Beyonce from the start before she became Beyonce, when she becomes Beyonce, is she just like, cool, pay me like Beyonce, <laughs> or thank you for being there from the start? And that's, I think, a real interesting strategic question to think about athletes. So if we end up getting, signing somebody who's a freshman quarterback at some school right now and they become the number one pick and the next Patrick Mahomes and whatever, I don't think they're gonna to agree to a 12 year deal uh, as a freshman in college um, because that wouldn't be in their best interest. And so it's really about what's the real benefit of getting in early other than to say, look, we have college players uh, when we can still get a lot of our reach and things. Now, if we're trying to reach college football fans or there's an idea, that's where it depends. But like I said, how we're thinking of it right now is we haven't done a lot on the Pepsi side. Now Gatorade is a very different brand and they do a ton of stuff, very much player driven and all that too. So um, I'm very open to the space. We just haven't really done a lot because the creative ideas haven't really uh, been there yet. Todd, I have a, a, just a question that I wanted to make a little broader here. Yeah. The, um, I think every brand would love to do some of the stuff that you do um, in, the, in terms of penetrating the culture. And I know I worked at Unilever for a long time, and, and often we were able to do kind of big cultural things once, but in order to be able to repeat it the way that you have with the halftime show and, and your whole relationship with the Super Bowl is you have to have some proof that it did something, right, beyond just uh, it was cool. Because I think intuitively often we know judgmentally this is impacting our consumers, penetrating the algebra, how did you measure, you know, the, the, specifically the halftime show, how did you measure it all those years that you got to repeat it and spend yeah. the kind of money that you did on it? And lastly, and you don't, you can think about this if you don't have to, but yeah. is there, should we take away from it the fact that you're giving it up now that there was some um, lesser impact over the years or is that not really anything about yeah, it? Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a good question. The underpinning of your questions about like ROI measurements, like how, who, who, why does your CEO let you run around and do all this crazy shit, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's your question. Because we always have to put right. together the whole proposal so, and you know, no, so no, no, show, but totally. To so, so listen, it's, um, there's, 
we we do a lot of ROI analysis at, at PepsiCo as well. And I think there's what I would call like your traditional paid media ROI and the return. And we measure the crap out of that, of course, and really continue to drive the needle moving forward and have high efficiency stuff. Now, as you get into measuring cultural affinity, buzz, PR, earned media, it gets into these fluffy numbers that make us feel all warm and fuzzy. And when you go into the boardroom, they're like, the hell is an impression like what is this right and so you need to figure out how to balance those things and really help the organization understand like here's the benefit as you do a lot of these little things maybe it's how they all add up almost like pointillism over time to driving your brand equity and the reason why you want to the reason why brands exist is to help consumers make simpler decisions the reason why you want to build brand equity is over time you can charge pricing power you can drive more frequency of consumption you can there's of this kind of flywheel of benefits if you're a brand that people love and care about and and their customer lifetime value and so as you think about all that how all these little acts depend on all the, you know how those connect individually you can't necessarily go one for one on some of these things and say this one a lot of its cost relative to benefit something like the halftime show we used to measure something called um share a voice uh, as something right now on social media on super bowl sunday as a brand we wanted to be the most talked about connected brands and for we won the tw Twitter brand bowl for three years in a row. Last year alone, we had, I think, 72% of all conversations about brands on Super Bowl Sunday were about Pepsi online. And a lot of it was because of the halftime show, but a lot of it is also, we have a digital war room of talented people sitting in Twitter headquarters, like mobilizing tweets and figuring out what to say and how to respond and which gift to put out there. And I mean, we're we're going like deep on that and we're gonna be doing that again this, this week, you know, uh, for Super Bowl. And so it really just depends on the objective behind the campaign and all of that. So if we're launching a new innovation, obviously it needs to pull through to retail sales and what it looks like on shelf and all of that. If it's something that's more for brand building or buzz, we want to make sure we get the right metrics and kind of ladder back that it's reinforcing our brand position, which we know drives distinction, which we know drives brand equity, which, you know, and you go down that kind of line of thinking. So um, that's, that's like a big piece of it. But, uh, you know, we do a lot of measurement. You know, we're not loosey-goosey over here, too. We're very thoughtful around what we're doing. So no, no, and I'm sh you know, I'm I'm sure that you do. I'm I'm thinking, do you have a way of converting those proxy measures, the Twitter bowl yeah. and all that, into yeah. ultimately either brand or sales? And if yeah. you do, like you know, how, how do we do? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. And it's not like yeah, if we get, other if we could trend for an hour, we sell thirty thousand more units. No, it's it's not it's not that it's not science. And I think that's. I am fortunate to work for a company that understands the value of brand building. And I know a lot of companies are not like that as well, right? And as you look across industries, there are some companies where marketing is what I'd call the center of the wheel and they're brand led companies and they're trying to grow consumers. And there's some where marketing is a service function where, hey, there's a tech or some other thing and hey, we need to just lower funnel. How do you convert someone? Click on this, send that, you know, that. And again, we do a lot of lower funnel stuff as well with some of our digital things. But the reality is a lot of our products are not bought direct to consumer or, or bought in a grocery store or a convenience store and things like that. So there's benefit to some of this other stuff as well. And so it's all having a balance of this stuff and picking your shots too. I'm not saying go loosey goosey and start just doing crazy things all day. But if you have a moment or a beat to kind of do some of that while you do the smart stuff and then can show, then you get this flywheel of success where leadership trusts you a little bit more and lets you continue to push and um, because you're seeing it on both ends where the, the business is growing and the brand is as well. Okay, yeah. Hi, Todd. My name is Anya Puchilovska. I'm with FGPG, which is an experiential marketing agency. Cool. And huge fan, follower on LinkedIn with okay. 50,000 followers. <laughs> you have almost 50,000 followers sure. on LinkedIn. So fan. my question to you is, what do you read? Any publications that you consume? Mm. Any podcasts that you might listen? Um, books you're reading? Anything you can share with us that helps you stay up to date, helps you be innovated, helps you put out content on LinkedIn that we find so valuable? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I it's, it's interesting. I don't listen to a lot. Of, I don't have a lot of time to listen to a lot of podcasts. When I go home, I'm hanging with my kids and, and do, you know, binging on Netflix and like everybody else is just trying to escape the world that we're all living in. But the, um, I'd say the, um, 
Yeah, I, I read like the ad trades and I'm all, I'm always inspired by just seeing little nuggets and ways in from other brands and stuff. I always like every year at can I always go down into the basement and you watch all their the, the ideas and the videos of these submissions that win all these things. And just a, a lot of times it's just getting inspiration from other brands and other things that are happening. Um, it's staying current with the news and, um, you know, what's going on in pop culture and getting little alerts and like, oh, my God, this person got traded or this person has a scandal or what, you know, and and just um, and frankly, a lot of it is with my team. Like, um, I don't know half the stuff. My team's like, oh my gosh, you got? Did you see on Real Housewives last night what happened? I'm like, no, but that sounds. Let's talk about you know, like, and so it's just connecting with people on all that stuff. And uh, but yeah, there's not really a, a method to the madness. It's just kind of just trying to stay stay fresh and see what's happening. So good, no worries. Todd, on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for your no time. Thank you.